Hello everyone, good evening, uh, and welcome to this thinking that's intended to ask one of the more difficult questions I think we've asked ourselves, can art save the planet? Um, and difficult, not because there's an easy or glib answer, but difficult because it's an intersection of huge technical challenges and great cultural questions. And my colleague, Matt Dancona, often makes this point that for many of us, we grew up when our politics was defined, if you like, in the 80s and 90s as a branch of economics, that politics was a way of thinking about organization of the economy. But in the last noisy decade, it felt much more as though it's moved into the culture war. It's become a department of culture itself. And so as a result, we spend a lot of our time at Tortoise talking about the culture of politics. This evening, we want to talk about the politics of culture and questions about the way in which our culture, in particular, the arts, engage in addressing the most pressing global problem of our times. And as you saw from some of the uh, notes there from our guide at the beginning, there are a few like two, two elements to this. There's one which is something that is measurable and manageable, um, but largely unmanaged, which is the extent to which the global arts industry itself is looking to its footprint. And there's a second, which is what's the responsibility of arts organizations and artists to help us rethink our behavior and the behavior of our systems, economics, politics, and the rest. And so I'm really grateful to Suzanne and to Alison and to Matthew and Francis for bringing so many different perspectives this evening. I hope that for those of you who've not been to a Think In before, you will appreciate our, our approach to these questions. We're trying to come away with a better informed point of view. We're trying to come away having, if you like, a better informed argument on the subject. And so for that reason, we actually don't want people to ask questions. What we really want is each of you to give your point of view. I'm gonna to come to as many people as possible, do weigh in in the uh, chat, um, and I'll try and pick that up and weave that into the conversation. Um, we have a loosely enforced rule, no questions. We want you to tell us, as I said, what, what you think. But I'm gonna start, if I might, with you, Francis, because I imagine, I imagine that in your role at the Tate, people are looking to you to somehow not, not just enlighten us, but to instruct, to have, an, have a culture that tells us something about how we can handle the climate emergency. And, and it, it must be such a delicate set of judgments to make that. So how do you think about it? Well, it's such a good question. Um, how do I think about it? I mean, I think uh, I don't have the answers, but I think, of course, asking the questions is the first place to begin. And I think the other thing I would begin by saying is that it, for me, having been schooled in the humanities with a sense of the history of art and methodologies and theories and a kind of uh, set of uh, tools that for the first time in my life, I feel that I'm kind of navigating uh, terrain that I'm very unfamiliar with. And I think that's both because I am literally unfamiliar and I'm not a scientist uh, and I'm not, I don't have a long background in ecology, but because we are living through a period of massive uncertainty. And uh, I do know that we've, uh, COVID has um, rapidly brought us, uh, escalated a situation that we were already aware of and already begin, beginning to think about. But I, and I also know that the kind of toolkit that, I mean, one of the reasons we're gathering today is that um, Julie's Bicycle's amazing uh, piece of work around the global uh, art market or the visual arts sector, uh, which encourages actions across the whole sector to, to green and reduce, to become a greener and leaner sector. But I do know for one thing, and I'm sure of this, that that is just stage one in a much bigger process that, as you say, will lead to an interrogation of our structures and systems, because those are the things that are driving our, our impact on the world. And they are the things where you see this intersection of climate, social and racial justice. And those systems and structures in turn uh, are based on a set of behaviors and values that have been inscribed in the cultural sector for decades and that we need to challenge because there seems to be an increasing gap between 
the true cost of what we're doing and the true cost is not just its monetary cost, it's cost to the planet. So that's its impact, but also the true value. And I think that's where I'm really interested in art is where is its true value and what can it offer the world at a time of uh, kind of existential crisis uh, as we are entering at the moment. And Francis, this is completely impressionistic and I'm not deeply in the world that you're in, but it's fair to say that if you look at art and its arguments with the world we live in, whether it's around race or gender or sexual violence, that there's been a, a volume and body of work around those issues, those social justice issues, and there just hasn't been the equivalent when it comes to climate. Is that, is that fair or am I just wrong about that? Well, it's interesting because I think, I mean, art, the art world, the world you encounter when you walk through the doors of a museum like Tate Monts, a little bit like going through the wardrobe into Narnia. And what you encounter is Narnia. And right. what we've shown in Narnia for almost, you know, in for forever is a, is a winter landscape where it's never spring because we've chosen to see it in that way. But actually, if you look at the work in our collections and the practice of artists with a different set of, with a different pair of glasses, there's a huge history of both um, the kind of ecological story being played out through the history of art, through the la history of landscape painting, for example, speaks of, you know, um, uh, the history of, of, of the commons or the decommoning of, of the UK, but it also speaks of climate activism. And there's a long history of climate activism. You know, we've always shown Joseph Boyce and Gustav Metzger as sort of great conceptual artists, but they were pioneers in drawing our attention to what was happening uh, to the world. So I think one of the things that, that people like me have to do, and I'm responding to people like Suzanne in doing this, is actually give voice and give a platform to the artists who have been and are speaking out on behalf of the planet. And they're just as powerful as the artists speaking out on behalf of race. I, I want to, Francis, I want to come back to your you know, sort of question about the, the politics of our culture and the whole question of you know, some people are asking even now about what the value is, the risks of the politicization of art um, in the way people often talk about the politicization of theater. But you mentioned Alison Tickell's work and Julie's Bicycle and the Art of Zero, Alison, and Francis described it as stage one. It's a pretty big stage one, isn't it, in terms of dealing with the footprint of the global arts industry itself. Yeah, it is. Um, I, 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 I'd just like to agree very much with what Francis just said. Um, I think we're in, it, there's a lot to be done, some of which we can do and some of which we're reliant on the bigger uh, infrastructures around us. But I, I do think, and I'd like to sort of say right, as a sort of, as, as one of the most important things that I, I can bring to this is that what we know about climate, the climate crisis and, and our responses to it is that it is actually intersectional. And I'd really like, before we go much further, to challenge this idea that it's either or, it isn't. Well, either, uh, either, water, either, water, either water or what? So it's either, we, either do, we either sort of deal with the carbon footprint, which is an inherently, um, un, you know, it, it's a kind of, it's, it's, it's quite a sort of clunky frame, right. actually. Um, I think if we can bring together the, 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 what is too often uh, divided, which is values and action, uh, and we go to a very simple but, but really critical philosophical starting point that we actually do need to walk the walk on this and that there isn't a division between walking the walk and talking the talk as there is so often the polarization of creative content and creative action is I think inherently uh, deeply problematic and certainly in our work I mean this piece of work was about the carbon footprint it's critical we have to we have to deal with uh, with global heating we have to deal with it rapidly we have to deal with it efficiently and we have to deal with it with great commitment but we can only do it if we recognize that the climate crisis is a is a, a much bigger crisis of uh, of, uh, of values it's a result of a, a very extractive approach to the world. And actually we need to solve it um, without taking out carbon and thinking if we bring enough carbon down, we'll, be, we'll have solved the problem because the problem is so multifaceted. And Alison, aren't there some people, some artists even, who would say, actually, no, I'd rather separate the mechanistic 
element of this from the emotional one, not least because I, I'd like to, I, even if this is slightly grandiose, I'd like to create some art that's eternal, that's not dealing with a 50 year carbon emergency. I'd like you in the arts I industry to figure out your footprint. So I don't need to feel guilty about what museums or what art collections are doing. But in terms of my art, I don't want to have to, you know, you know skip to the tune of any political agenda. Uh, I'm sure there are, James, and I think it's important that we don't dump responsibility onto the artist. Uh, I, you know, for a start, I would say that uh, really rethinking the way all of us, so I, I don't want to create a neurotic space for the artist. Yes. I think we really do need to kind of look at this as a creative challenge for all of us, including the artist, but we can't assume that all the responsibility lies with the artist. They've, they have the burden of so much on their shoulders. What I'm saying, I suppose, is that this is a systemic problem. It requires a systemic solution. And certainly in our work, what JB does, what Julie's Bicycle, my company does, is to to try to support triggering, prompting into a much deeper engagement with what this whole uh, moment, uh, and it is an existential moment because it goes so deep. I'm not talking in terms of mortality, immortality. I'm talking about us really having a look at how we got here, what we're doing here, and crucially how we get ourselves into a different space. And that, so it is a systemic issue Certainly in the work that we have found um, for 15 years of, of working with, uh, with organizations, with individuals, once people really start to engage with this journey, it unfolds for them. And the deeper you go into it, uh, whether it be through dealing with being committed to reducing uh, your, your greenhouse gas emissions, which often means doing a whole host of other things as well, which, which impact other areas, but once you start on that journey, it unfolds into, uh, provided you stay on it, but it's very compelling and it necessarily requires us to think a little bit differently about who we are in relation to ourselves, one another and the world in which we live. So it's triggers. It's true. Well, it, it's, it's, it's really interesting you say that because there are a number of people, as you were talking, Alison, who've been writing about the relationship between the art in our lives and the science in our lives. And I want to come in a moment to Ashley Naismith and, and hear from John Barracosa and Maria Vega, uh, sorry, sorry, John Drummond and Maria um, Vega Barracosa in a moment. But, but Suzanne and Matthew, can I just hear from, from you first, if I might? Suzanne, what, what do you think, uh, if, if you were sort of sitting on Francis's shoulder in particular, thinking about what the responsibility of a large arts organisation is to art and artists, and then also to society more generally. How do you strike that balance? Yeah, definitely. I think it's really important to think about a lot of the work that already has happened in terms of this call for accountability um, from the art world. Um, as someone who's been working at the front line of the extractive industries of you know, BP and Shell and that relationship that they have with the Tate and with other museums and galleries. Um, you know, we've been calling to attention the way that galleries have offered the social license for them to continue. For instance, you know, BP days after it had a massive spill, had a summer party at the Tate. So that relationship has been gone ongoing about calling into question how the relationships between the galleries continue to allow those um, corporations to operate. And I think that's a conversation and it's not necessarily um, yeah, a battle. So ongoing accountability about how do galleries and museums give power um, and spaces for fossil fuel companies to continue. So that's one thing to continue to interrogate that relationship. I just want to ask you about that because obviously that changed quite a while ago. I mean, partly no doubt in response to your campaigning, that, that changed and those relationships in some way, in many places came to an end. I think, I don't know, Franz, I think I'm right in thinking that did come to an yeah, end. Yeah, that specific sponsorship came to an end, but it's an ongoing conversation about the art world in general. That, and that's what I wanted to ask you. Is, what I wanted to ask is now, when the world it seems has moved on, and in some ways actually what you're seeing is these companies falling over each other to announce what they're doing in terms of net zero. Mm. What's the role that you think of artistic institutions in terms of, the, the, the partnerships they strike, the relationships they strike with those broader actors in the economy. 
Yeah, I think it's about, first and foremost, we're, we're in a crisis and about how do we use the resources of the gallery? So, you know, as Francis was saying, it's about how do we also bring to light the relationship that has existed with art within climate movements before. So if we think about Ken Sarawiwa and Nigeria and the role of cultural producers in the climate movement. So how do we have more relationships as we've been saying of people who already work within the climate movement? How do we get commissioned? How do we get more um, gallery space to actually tell the story, to actually convene and have these conversations? You know, we're often just brought in to be the speakers so there's a completely thinking about, at the moment, it's not necessarily people of color who are even getting the commissions um, right. to make the exhibitions about climate change. It's still predominantly white artists. So there's a restructuring that needs to go there that we tell the story of the climate crisis, the framing of the crisis and the reality of it, of how we're speaking it and how we're experiencing it. And we just saw that with the Turner Prize that you know a lot of the organizations that were nominated for that, but we need to see those long-term relationships um, commitments to us producing those works. But, but, but Matthew, before I come to, can I just go back to Francis on that point? We, we had a thinking back in the days where we used to hold these conversations in our newsroom, which was in fact about whether or not oil companies should be allowed to back arts organizations at all. And one of the people there was Richard Lambert, chair of the British Museum. And, and we talked that evening about something that was quite a big change in my way of thinking. He talked about the assumption that we've grown up with of museums as neutral spaces, as that they were places where people could come and bring you know, different narratives, different histories, different points, to, points of view, but that the institution itself was neutral. And that that had, of course, had been quite an important thing, but he was recognizing that was changing. And I wondered how you think about Tate in that context, where it needs to be neutral and where it has to have, if you like, a position. Francis, you're muted, sorry. There you are. Um, I don't think new, I don't think museums are neutral spaces at all. Um, I think they're very complicated spaces. They're both uh, uh, they both platform the views of you know the thought leaders who run them, but they also host the the voices of the many artists and and groups that participate in them. So they're much more of a kind of complex civic space where voices come together. And I wouldn't. I mean, I think we're no longer no museum would purport, I think, uh, to see itself as an institution that tells people stuff any longer. It's an institution that is in conversation with people. And that is the direction of, undoubtedly, the direction of travel. And I think that does raise, it, but institutions are still in a very powerful position. And they have to uh, act with absolute integrity in relation to the artists they invite in. Uh, the, the way they conduct themselves and also to the, the, the corporates and the individuals who support them in funding. And one of the really interesting things for me during this climate journey is that we have now introduced sustainability as part of a key element in our ethical, you know, the kind of ethical search we do in relation to uh, funding bodies and individuals. Mm -hmm. And I think that is that is the only responsible way forward because I don't think we can or should uh, have another BP situation on our hands. It was unacceptable, uh, it, out, it outlived the relationship by a number of years. And um, the only great legacy actually of BP is that the Liberate Take group were a remarkable group of activist artists and leave an amazing legacy in the works of art they made, their, their actions. And I, um, their work uh, really persuaded me of the power of an importance of museums working with activist groups. Is there, by the way, is there a collection of Liberate Take art? Is there somewhere that I can go and see that? Unfortunately, it's not at the Tate, though we do have some, some archival material relating to their activations, but I can't remember what year it was, but they walked into the turbine hall one year with a huge blade of a, a turbine, in a turbine blade. It was the most astonishing, powerful gesture of this incredibly beautiful kind of Brancusi-like thing speaking to climate emergency. It was just like totally brilliant and that was for, it persuaded a lot of people of the power of the artist's voice well we could we could and i'm sure we could go down the rabbit hole of discussing that and the, and the role <laughs> not a rabbit hole 
No, no, but there's a whole question in there about how arts organizations and, you know, campaigners like you, Suzanne, engage with companies as they change. That's also a whole question. But let's park that for a second, because I want to go to Matthew, if I might. Matthew, thank you for your patience. I, I, I'm really interested, if you would, for, us, for you to give us a bit of a kind of historical context. I know it's awful when people of our age get asked for historical context. It says something about how far we've got. But, you know, when you started Freeze as a magazine, I'm interested to know what the politics of it was and whether there was any politics to it. Then Freeze as an art fair, how you thought about different forms of politics and particularly climate and how you bring that thinking now to what you do with arts organisations more generally. Yeah, I mean, I guess I've always thought of our role um, as enabling artists and enabling the most interesting artists around, um, you know, to do what they do. Uh, and, you know, um, and, uh, analyzing it, criticizing it, publicizing it, et cetera, and not telling them what to do. So the, it's, Freeze has always been political, but with a very small P, I would say. And I think we have to remember there's, uh, you know, a lot of art that's made is abstract art. It would be difficult to call abstract art political art in any way. It doesn't mean those artists are not political people and don't have opinions and don't want to do something uh, that, um, you know, to, to challenge this climate crisis that we're in. So there's a lot of the art world that, that you know, wants to get involved and wants to make a difference and feels a little bit powerless. Um, and I kind of don't believe in, and I don't think anyone here does, believe in, you know, telling artists what to, um, what to do and what message to give. I think the message comes from them and it's our job to, to enable that. Um, I also think it'd be a shame if every gallery and museum, um, you know, uh, silenced any artist making abstract art, for example. You know, that just doesn't make sense. And I don't think they're planning to do that either. So, so this idea that we're sort of telling artists what to do, I mean, it's not, it's just not what happens. You know, we, we'll look for the most interesting artists out there and, and then we kind of enable their voices to come through. So we tried to do that with the magazine and then with the fairs um, as well in a kind of physical way. Obviously the, the fairs are more commercial than the magazine. The fairs are really about the art market and about the art commercial galleries and um, enabling people to buy art and support artists in that way. Um, but um, in, in 2008 and 2010, my kind of introduction to climate was really with Alison, uh, where Julie's Bicycle did our first uh, carbon audits. So we did them for, for a couple of years in those years. And then with them, we launched the Green Guide to the Visual Arts with the, the then mayor of London, Boris Johnson, uh, which we put out and I think just got went into the ether somewhere and maybe some people read it. But, um, you know, it was quite a pioneering thing. It was 10 years ago now. And uh, I was quite proud of, proud of that. Um, and we found from our audits that 60% of the emissions that Freeze created, what they call scope one and scope two, not scope three, which is travel, which is a whole other ball game, was from the diesel generators that we used. And so we're now running on biodiesel, uh, not the kind that cuts forests down, but the kind is, that's a kind of better kind using recycled vegetable oil and stuff like that. So we managed to reduce our carbon footprint by 60% by doing that. Um, so that was kind of my introduction to it. And then earlier this year, oh, uh, no, early last year, a year ago, Thomas Dane asked me to be part of this Galleries Climate Coalition, which we launched, uh, which does free carbon calculator for galleries and actually artists can do it as well. Um, and then advises people how to reduce their carbon very much in the same way that Juice Bicycle has done for the, for the museum sector. And, um, and uh, then make suggestions about other ways that you can contribute to reducing the climate crisis. Um, outside of just reducing your own emissions. So, so can I ask you, Matthew, then if I, if I was being a little rude, I might say, well, we've got the answer to our question, which is, can art save the planet? No, art can do its bit. It can, it can change mm -hmm. its own footprint, put its house in order. I see Alison smiling at me as I go down this route, but mm -hmm. it can make that argument. But mm -hmm. the truth is that much of art is abstract, I think it, I think there are many people who think that political art, like political theatre or political music, is the somehow inferior cousin of art or theatre or music. And so we shouldn't overly expect that art and artists help drive a systemic or cultural change around climate. Would, would you would you be a buyer of that argument? Yeah, I mean, I I, I definitely don't think political art is a second class citizen uh, anymore. I think that 
one might have thought that 30 years ago it's definitely not the case now there's loads of fantastic political artists the last 50 years that are, are absolutely highly rated and super exciting so i would never say that um but i think the art world and artists are looking at themselves thinking what can we do this is such a huge problem and in my opinion um you know this is such a big issue it's such a big global issue it's so pressing that the most powerful people in the world are the ones who need to take the reins on this it's governments and it's corporations mm -hmm. and the art world cannot directly change it what we can do we're a very influential small but influential sector and what right. we can do is influence those people and you know you talk to mps and they say look i would bring up climate more in the house of commons but i don't get letters about it it's right. not the thing people think about they don't write to me about that they write to me about knife crime or immigration or whatever it's not the front of the public's agenda so there is the point that we can um do whatever we can to to, to you know to influence those those people um but it's a you know it's an absolute i mean i think everyone would agree mm. it's shocking that we're not running on fully renewable energy now it's shocking that there's still no duty on air fuel mm. you know there's been so many cops you know and we're still governments are still not put these things into action you're, you're, and there's like eight years of carbon left to spend i mean it's 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 an absolute immediate crisis the art world cannot directly change those things there are people who can directly change those things so but how do we influence those people that's the question art can change the baseline and the way in which we think which on which now i'd like to bring in john drummond so i don't know whether people know this but even before we even got going John Drummond was making what I thought a really interesting point about the way in which art itself impacts our thinking. And I don't know, John, whether you're there and want to weigh in on that. There you are. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, I wonder if I might make a slightly different point. Um, yep. I'll, 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 I'll return to that if you like. But I've been having a look at this whole issue of uh, cl the climate emergency and the relationship to uh, the art simply because of the nature of uh, our brain and our bodies is we kind of the arts for me is a route to tapping into our senses and emotions and when you it, 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 if you look at uh, the aborigines and their approach to song lines uh, and how uh, the arts uh, in aboriginal culture uh, and that sense of being a part of the land uh, is, is for me, it's just built into the culture. So the, the, the idea that the arts, the planet and humanity are all part of the same uh, context rather than as separate from, apart from each other, they are part, they're a part of each other. Uh, so I think that, that, uh, that, you know, we can learn a lot from the way that, that uh, the history of Aboriginal culture taps in to the value of arts uh, and the importance of place uh, and climate, all as part of the same thing. Uh, John, thank you. It's really interesting, this, the, 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 particularly your point about um, place, it feels to me, it is one that is going to be a bigger and bigger issue, both in the politics of our culture and the culture of our politics too. I, I, I'm going to, uh, if I can, just bring in, um, I don't know whether Maria, are you there? I see you make, make a point, but I don't know whether or not you're on camera. Uh, yes, you I'm are. here. Thank you. Um, no, I mean, I was just, um, I've recently been listening to this very interesting podcast, which is called Green Canvas, and it's actually spotlighting the work of artists, whether they are um, sculptors, uh, photographers, or even fashion designers, and that are looking to address this issue of climate change and sustainability and trying to incorporate that in their art and a lot of the stuff that they've been doing including the renowned sculpture um jason de Carres, i think i'm pronouncing it wrong he actually said that they don't define themselves as the experts in this but what they're trying to do is bring that human element to the science that sometimes feels like it's quite detached um from what we are hearing in the news and so 
what John DeCaro is actually doing, I think, uh, Jason, sorry, is um, he's done a lot of underwater work um, with coral reefs. And basically, one of his stuff is actually being um, nominated as the top 25 wonders of the world. And it's impressive, impressive stuff. And it's actually kind of trying to get um, uh, coral reefs back up again and uh, bringing back the nature of the underwater life. And I think what they're trying to do is basically, um, again, trying to showcase that art is essential to try to tell the science story because sometimes we can't really see through facts. It's very hard to see something that's happening in the future to talk about the degrees and all of that stuff when you can't really see it. And also when all of this stuff that is happening right now is happening in underdeveloped world or countries, and I'm sorry to use that word because I don't think it's the way we should be using it. But it's so, um, I guess, again, it's the idea that we can't see it because we're not there. We're privileged enough to be in a safe bubble. And so what artists are doing or flying out, even photographers, is trying to showcase that human element of it that we are not able to do so. So I think, um, again, how art is saving the planet, if I go back to that, answering that question in my perspective is to bring that element of humanity and um, yeah, bringing back the emotions to it. Gloria, thank you. Francis, I actually have a question for you, but do you want to come back on that? Um, just basically to say, I think those two really powerful examples of the, the ability that art has to speak through metaphor and storytelling in a way that speaks so much more strongly than a lot of you know scientific literature or political um rhetoric but i think there's there's also something else that's really important that addresses that can art save the planet or actually can the planet survive without art which is that uh, the, the ecosystem of art is is a really weird uh, and complicated hybrid ecosystem it's not like the business world it's interesting nobody's writing about culture and climate at the moment and i think it's because it's so complicated but it has a weird ability um, or disability to span public and private and to also combine this kind of profit with purpose mm -hmm. so these in in um incompatible things somehow do resolve in art and I think it's dealing with the incompatible that will save the planet and at the moment we live in a very divisive society that you know with binary oppositions uh, uh, deep inequalities and I think so there's something about the art world the, the, the cultural sector that as an ecosystem that kind of that we can recon reconcile within it those internal contradictions and that does mean that we can offer uh, uh, examples uh, ways of behaving that might move us along a little bit but first can I just ask you do, do you do you look around and think Actually, we're now at a stage where the FTSE 100 companies have got sustainability offices and, you know, we're holding the COP26 and governments and ministers are spending every hour of the day thinking about this. You are in charge of an artistic institution that is free, perhaps required to think about things that are, if you like, more elemental, go beyond the kind of current political agenda and to an extent it's almost like we want our artists and maybe we even want our curators to think yeah yeah you guys go and fix the planet i'm going to get to the heart of the human experience how do you how do you I, the trouble is that i think they might fix the planet in the narrowest possible terms right. they might deal with the footprint but they're not going to deal with racial justice or global inequalities or rewilding our forests in a deep way or are, you know the, one of the things that I've always tried to do when I talk about climate and ecological emergency actually is is talk about it in the context of say the UN sustainability goals mm -hmm. because it's embedded in a whole range of deeply worrying inequalities and to just go on as we are with um, you know uh, green energy doesn't seem to me much point mm -hmm. because <laughs> But I'm, I'm interested. I'm just going to ask Suzanne just the same question from a different point of view. It, when, I understand the campaign around the organisations that are associated with arts organisations. 
But is there also not something about art that you want to, if you like, be protected from the daily political arguments and from the current, if you like, the, the rows that you're picking up on the radio shows in the morning and the TV programs at night, that art is art and is somehow not necessarily burdened by these political arguments. What do you think of that? I guess it depends how you were born. As a queer brown woman living in Brexit Britain, when I'm seeing 4,000 people die a day from COVID in India right now, the political is inherent with my being. It's connected to the art. All of the artwork that I make comes from responding to um, cultures where um, I'm trying to lift up the humanitarian issues as well. So I think that's an interesting luxury that we don't necessarily have. And I'm actually trained as a philosopher. So I have been in that space of thinking for thinking's sake. Um, but when we're talking about the climate crisis, you cannot separate those things. And I don't think we want to separate them. And I think that's why we have to think about this as a renaissance. It's mm -hmm. a paradigm shift. And the role the artists played in the previous paradigm shifts and renaissance we've had. So one part of that is illustrative, as was mentioned, to illustrate the crisis, to translate the science, to lift up the emotions. Then the other part of it is innovation. It's mm -hmm. to bring back science and art, to have a table where you have textile makers thinking with data scientists, with crypto developers, you know, and I think that's where's a really interesting point. If you look at NFTs right now, the art world is radically changing. Who is an artist? How we do that? How capital is moving in it? And obviously there's a question about the footprint of cryptos, of course, but the possibilities, those possibilities, because the crisis is so terrifically horrible, you have to be in that space of um, innovation, illumination to get to where we need. So they're not necessarily disconnected. And of course, you still need elevation. You still need art to lift your spirit. But um, when you're coming from that position, you know, for me, art is rethinking the insurance industry. It's all about paradigm shift and thinking of these systems in a new way. Right. Um, Suzanne, thank you. Um, Alison, I saw you were wanted to jump in and I'm going to do that and I'm going to invite Phoebe actually just to comment on one of the elements of the art of uh, zero report that you did. Um, yeah so I just wanted to to sort of support what Suzanne was saying again I think we're in danger of of picking bits off and looking at uh, at the sort of the act of art as being um, as being a, a specific thing. There's a very good frame that we um, that somebody called Karen O'Brien has come come up, come up with, which is really looking at our responses to, to this situation that we all find ourselves in. All of us. This is so. This is you know. It is. It, it, it is nothing if it's not a a collective endeavor and it's asking us to work collectively and and wherever we are to to rise to this moment and um and to sort of move in and out of it and the arts can mobilize a lot. they're very good at mobilizing and all those other things that Suzanne was saying and indeed Francis but uh, there's also uh, I think um Karen O'Brien's come up with these four kind of, these three kind of D's. There's a dutiful response. Sometimes we have to work within the system. Uh, then there's a disruptive response, which is where we do things really differently. And the last area is, is a kind of dangerous response and how we flow in and out in order to disrupt the current status quo, which is, is kind of critical. And the worst thing I think that we can do, and I keep coming back to this, is thinking that there's one response there's a linear response that we need if we deal with one bit we'll be all right actually it's a constant multi-dimensional flow in and out and re we i really think we're, we must avoid if we possibly can the idea that there's one thing we can do Alison, can I ask you one thing because when i was reading up about julie's bicycle it, it started i think i'm right with music right it wasn't about visual arts to begin with right? and so for people who are trying to understand, all right, how does the, how did the music industry change? Can you tell us a little bit about that? About what was yeah? Just just tell us a little bit about that experience and what you think reads across into the visual arts. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, they're, they're they're very similar because change processes are very similar. So it started in the UK music industry at the same at our, same time that there were all these crazy live Earth gigs, um, and actually what happened a very simple idea was that actually we can't legitimately uh shriek about climate change by singing a song about it 
we actually have to really understand what this means for ourselves. So that was a, that instant sort of sense of responsibility about understanding what the issue was, wherever you are in that industry and taking action to deal with it. So what's been interesting about that, and you know, the music industry, like all industries, ebbs and flows. One minute it's very preoccupied with the digital world, the next minute it, it'll sort of jump into a sort of climate mobilization and it's really mobilizing at the moment brilliantly but one of the things that we have learned is as I said earlier that there is um, an approach to, to change so it's really about change which is about uh, uh, you know embodying some of the values that this this is that, that it takes in order to deal with this issue it, with with the kind of level of depth integrity knowledge um, orienting around issues around justice around love and care mm. but also knowing that this, this can be difficult it you know it's challenging we need to work together and come together on this but that by so doing the whole thing actually opens out for us and the key bit that we need to do is get on the same page on this right uh, uh, Alison um uh, let me bring a few few more people. Kirsty Lang, I'd like to hear from, and then Louise Simpson in a moment. Kirsty, I'm just going to pick up. Uh, I wanted to pick up actually. I think it was on Matthew's point about politicians saying, "Well, one of the problems about climate change is it it isn't one of the things that features in my inbox. It's not something that worries voters." And I think it's uh, to do with the scale of it. The scale of it is very very frightening, um, and people find it hard to get their heads around. And I think one of the things that art can do, and I, I use this in the, the broadest term from, you know, visual artists, to photographers, to filmmakers, to novelists and so on, is tell stories. Because we know evolutionary biologists have told us that the brain is hardwired to accept complex information in story form. And so I think that is the great thing that art can do, is to tell stories about where you live and how climate change is and, and, and bring you stories from elsewhere and hold up a mirror. Uh, and that is the crucial thing. And, and just finally, and that's why I find it so frightening, the government's plans uh, to cut funding to art subjects in universities, uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, uh, telling stories, teaching our young people to think creatively is absolutely critical going forward. Kirsty, th Kirsty, thank you. Louise Simpson, you, you made a point in the chat about art not being an industry. Hold on, Louise, we can't hear you. One second. There we are. There it's go. become an industry, but it isn't an industry. I mean, it's it. You know, art, artists do what they do, regardless of what's going on around them. What is really interesting about art is, is that you can understand kind of what they were aiming at, probably after they've done it. I don't think you, I mean, anything, this is all sniffing and whiffling of commissioning people to do something. That's not what art is about. There will be people out there that have been dealing with climate change for 50 years. And I think um, one of the speakers has probably mentioned somebody who has been involved with that for all their lives instinctively, but you can't tell artists what to do. There will be storytellers out there that are telling stories about what's going on, but that isn't art. Good. Louise, thank you. I, I just want to, um, Phoebe, if you wouldn't mind, this is my colleague Phoebe Davis, who did the brilliant job of trying to actually marshal all the different information around the arts. And 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 thanks, Alison, to no small part to the JB report on the art of zero. Phoebe, can we just go one, look at one of those slides? Because you talked about, you know, when you say, Alison, let's get on the same page, I thought it would be useful just for a moment to get on one page. Are you there? Yeah, no, I'm I'm here. So yeah, we were just looking specifically at um, the second slide that we put up, which comes from that report, and I'll and I'll drop it in again. It's it's worth a full read through. This is just a snapshot, clearly, and there's lots of great recommendations in there as well. So um, this is the the total cost of art, if you if you take it as that globally, um, and 70 billion tons. Um, to kind of put that in a bit of uh, a way to quantify that, you probably put out as an average person, if you're in the UK, eight and a bit tons a year. So you're looking at about eight million people over the year, and um, in the Report, they kind of give the comparison of 22 million hectares of forest um so we're talking a vast amount and and most of that as you can kind of see comes from visitor travel mm -hmm. so that's a key part of it you know though and something that's been impacted clearly by the pandemic but will essentially come back again um and then the other 18 million 
um, kind of sits in between artist studios, businesses, commercial art galleries, business travel. Um, one of the other slides we looked at was um, art shipment, the difference between putting a piece of art on a boat and the piece and a piece of art on a plane. Um, there is a big difference there. So there's all these kind of minutia within it. But um, ultimately, it also does come down to the consumer of the art and, and us moving around. It doesn't just come down to the artist. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's worth a read. It's worth uh, reading around the Gallery Climate Coalition, who does some some similar work with Julie's Bicycle and and you know looking at that and auditing ourselves. But it is important to say that I did struggle to find other galleries who are willing to put that information out there. Um, so it, it would be good to kind of push other galleries to do that. Well, I, that's helpful, Phoebe. I don't want it to, to look as though we're giving too good a report to the arts in general when they're not necessarily uh, re reporting as much themselves. But 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 can I, in the last 10 minutes, Francis and, uh, and Matthew, get down some brass tacks. If you, let's say, take the drift of this conversation, which says, look, we, we can't overreach in terms of what art can do and certainly not what commissioned artists can do, but there are two sets of things that are realistic. One is, art dealing with its own emissions, its own impact on the world, but also shifting the baseline in terms of public perception and therefore moving our politics. I can see where that conversation gets you. The third leg of it would be, I would have thought, but, but at the moment there are real challenges to our arts organizations at a local and national level within education and more broadly in society. And I wanted just to get at some of that. I wanted to hear, Francis, if you would, have a go first. At, if you were then making the third part of this case, which is, this is what art needs now to help deliver on that climate agenda, what you would like to see. Okay, um, I'll try and do this briefly. Um, just picking up on the last slide, which where you saw this huge um, carbon footprint for uh, international for travel and that's the moving of people around the world attending art fairs visiting museums the same if you looked at Tate's footprint and we have an audit from Julie's bicycle uh, of, a, of the hundred percent of the the bigger footprint 80 percent is driven by visitors to Tate from abroad so that's a so that's really where we're impacting now when you look at the way we uh, make our programs and distribute our funding, uh, an equivalent amount goes into what you would call our, our big exhibition program, our main stage operations, our blockbuster exhibitions. So we spend a great deal of our budget to produce these high quality, very international programs for international visitors. And that drives the business, but it also drives our values. So for example, last year we did a Andy Warhol show on the morning that we opened the show, uh, the uh, Today um, you know, uh, Radio 4 program announced that Warhol was now officially the most important artist in the world. And evidence for that was that his prices were now higher than any other artist had ever been in the history of the auction houses. So what I'm trying to say in a nutshell is that a blockbuster system draws all your resources and puts it into a set of values that probably take you closer to the marketplace than the values that you really have at your heart, where you think of yourself as a local museum embedded in London. And somewhere our, our values have got out of sync with our values. If you know, our, our costs have got out of sync with our bad values. And I think the single most important thing we have to do is think about that intersection of our behaviors and our values in relation to uh, how we interact in this ecosystem. And if we could replace the kind of blockbuster values around first scene competition, millions of visitors competing with other arts organizations with the kind of values that really play out locally, which are to do with participation and collaboration and thinking about the air quality in Bankside, we'd be getting there, but we would be becoming a very different kind of organization and we would be working in a very different ecosystem. Francis, for that to happen, right? So some people would disagree with you on the grounds of access to extraordinary art, the experience of the blockbuster informing people and activating. Yeah. Who for though? Once you look at who's coming to the museum, we're privileging a privilege, very privileged audience with artists very privileged by the marketplace. So, so what, I, what I'm saying to you is that some people would, would disagree with that as a, as a curatorial decision. 
But let's say even if you take the curatorial decision as the right one in terms of an institution's role in, in society in the public square, for your version of things to work and not to put such a priority on the blockbuster, but to have, to use your phrase, that conversation with the public and with the local public, what needs to change in terms of funding? The what needs to change is that a brilliant person like Kate Raworth or Mariana Mazzucata or any of the other brilliant people who are writing these books <laughs> needs to think about culture. Real culture, the culture in its scientific sense of the stuff that we need to survive. So you're saying in the way in which we're thinking about the economics of innovation, we need to think about the economics of culture. We need to rethink it. Absolutely. OK, this is really annoying because if you notice, there's six <laughs> minutes left and we've now got the beginnings of a conversation about the whole of the art sector that we need to rethink top to bottom. But, we, you know, we, we're fine because I'm sure that Suzanne, Alison and Matthew are going to help us out here. Um, Matthew, do you want to respond to that? But also the question I had, which was, you know, what do you need the arts to be able to do to deliver on your point about changing the inbox of those politicians? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm going to leave, um, uh, you know, the, the, the presentation of art to to Francis, but I'm, I'm really gonna, what I've been thinking about the last year is what can we do uh, as individuals and as organizations to move the dial? Uh, what can we really do? What is gonna change it? You know, we can, we can, we can reduce our travel, we can re reduce air shipments, but I mean, did you know that one coal-fired power station in Europe, uh, Belchertau in Poland, has four times the amount of carbon emissions of the whole of the biggest air fleet in Europe, Ryanair? So the problem, if flying is about two two percent of global emissions, energy is over thirty percent. You know, there should not be any coal power fire stations existing anymore. There should not be any cars running on petrol. We should be running on totally total renewables as soon as possible. And what can we do to do that? So, what we're trying to do um, with the Climate Coalition is to say, look, um, reduce your emissions as much as you can, but you know. Art can evolve international travel. You're going to have to do some of it. But what, what can you do then as a kind of offset? You know, offsets have been um, very discredited for very good reasons. But what contributions can you make to, to make those changes, to put those changes? And we found a great organization, Client Earth, who may have had on tour just before. Uh, James Thornton started it 50 years ago. And they are actively taking governments and co companies to court to close down coal-fired power stations. And they reckon that, you know, for a contribution of about, about 150,000 pounds, they can close down a coal-fired power station. Now that has about a thousand times more impact than the same money planting trees or, or saving forests. And this is such stuff that's gotta be done immediately, soon. You know, the, 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 there's, uh, there's hardly any, budget left uh, of carbon uh, to create. And we, we should stop spending it. We should stop spending the budget. The, the, the energy is the number one source and we've got, all got to do something about it. So I'm more thinking about us as an industry, as individuals, as global citizens, than the message that our puts forward. Frankly, I think Greta Thunberg and Extinction Rebellion have done a brilliant job over the last two years getting the message across. I think most of us are now aware that there's a problem. And what I'm thinking about is what can we do beyond that to make immediate difference now? Matthew, thank you. Suzanne, what's your view? What would you, what would you like to see art do to, to, if you like, help save the planet? Yeah, I think one point there is just in response to that, that the climate movement started many, many years before Greta and XR, and there's been a complete rewriting of movement history. I would love the gallery and I would love to work with you, Francis, on this, on retelling and reclaiming the history of movements, because that's where a lot of the strategies, a lot of the people that have been erased by the white supremacy in the climate movement, so that's one role of the art gallery, is to give us that space again to retell that. The other thing is what Francis was talking about, is how do we remake the gallery? And this is a wild idea, but let's have the first NFT auction um, at the Tate, let's get the new resources that we need for the kinds of innovative, as I said, interdisciplinary, intersectional, intergenerational labs, where we can come up with the kinds of strategies that move beyond this. So I think that's what I would urge is when we're talking about art and climate change, it's not just about cleaning up shop, 
All of that needs to happen. Yes, we need to clean up the trail, but that's not it. It's about the leaps, the innovation, reclaiming our movement history, and also becoming international because this future scenario of climate change isn't a future scenario. It's happening right now. It's happening yesterday. We need the gallery to come into relationship about that. Suzanne, thank you. Alison, the last word to you. Uh, what a privilege to have the last word. So um, I really should give it to my co-panelists. I couldn't agree more, Suzanne. Uh, we, in 2015, we, we suggested in a big report for, for international arts councils, you need to set up innovation hubs with the creative community at its heart to do precisely this, Suzanne, although obviously um, you've moved it on. I think this is much bigger than reducing carbon because we, of course, we have to do that. It's an absolute imperative. Matthew, you're absolutely right. Client Earth is an amazing organisation. But this is a bigger opportunity to really rethink uh, and I, I think if we don't take this opportunity now, and nobody's mentioned much about COVID, you know, this is an incredible moment that we've, we can meet now with huge creativity. There are, there's so many people now in this space. We just need to open our hearts and our minds to see them, witness them, support them, reinforce them and get cracking. And how bloody fantastic that might be. Alison, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, at the end of the thinking, the job of the editor sitting here is to try and distill everything you've heard into a coherent argument, a better informed point of view, if you like. But I think you may have done that better than I possibly could with a simple phrase, get cracking. Get cracking might be the answer. For, for, for what it's worth, I just want to make three points. I think that the one thing that I kept thinking as I was doing a pretty lousy job of being provocateur here. Uh, it was obviously quite hollow, given that I wasn't even convinced by my own, the tenor of my own questions. But I remember when we started Tortoise being shown a constable painting and that the constable itself had made me rethink the way in which I see the sky. And so there is something particularly silly about asking whether or not art can you know, can renew or change our relationship with the environment, our, our, our place and planet. It's always done that. So there's something a little silly uh, I appreciate about the framing of that. But I do think that, you know, look, Alison, the, the, the Art Zero, uh, the Art Zero argument and the, the, the data is really important. I think the reason that you say your intersectionality point at the top matters, not just because it's a slightly artificial distinction between getting its emissions in order and the cultural impact, but because art is an industry of the mind, because it has such an impact in the culture of our society, it has to lead by example in terms of what it does on the ground. So I think that's a clear, you know, get cracking argument. I do think that Suzanne completely shot the fox on, you know, whether or not art overreaches when it steps into politics. I thought your point, uh, Suzanne, on the political is inherent in my uh, in my being was a was a brilliant phrase. And I really loved your definition of the of art around illustration, innovation, as well as elevation. And I thought that was that 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 really uh, uh, struck me. I do think that this point, I guess, that Matthew and Francis were both making there about how does art have a conversation with people so it changes the way in which we actively think. Art, as Kirsty talked about, as a storyteller, seems to me to be incredibly, incredibly powerful. And I am left with a question that that was sort of sprung on me by Francis's point at the end there, which is the blockbuster, the show, being potentially uh, an imitator of the marketplace rather than a, you know, a public service in the way in which you want your cultural institution to be. I don't, as you could see, Francis, know exactly what to think about that, having been a visitor to so many of those blockbusters and loved them and learned from them and then think, yes, well, maybe that's right. Maybe that isn't an engagement with place and engagement with the local conversation in quite that same way. Um, I don't know what to think about it. I do know that we've got a thinking coming up with Mariana Mazzucato and I am going to say to her, your next book should be on the economics of culture and how we, how we engage in innovation. And I must say particularly my final thought, which is I love the idea of an NFT auction. We are going to go straight from here, encrypt this thinking, turn it into an NFT, uh, 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 put it up for sale, and anyone who's got some spare coppers on them will be able to purchase it as and when that happens at Tate. Um, so on that note, thank you. It's been really uh, an illuminating conversation, uh, and one that in many ways took me by surprise. So a big thank you uh, to Suzanne, to Alison, to Matthew, and to Francis, and for everyone who's joined us this evening. Have a very good evening. Thank you.